Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated. Thank you, Tim. Great as always. Suzanne, appreciate you leading us in worship. And I just had a couple of things I wanted to mention. First of all, um, the Gideons. And I don't know if I told you about this, Mike, but uh, the Gideons were supposed to be here next week. But fortunately for us, because I didn't tell anybody, he's coming the 16th. So uh, I, I didn't believe the same fellow that was, has been here in the past. But the Gideons do a good thing, and uh, uh, it doesn't hurt us to help out wherever we can, since we are not such a big church that we can impact things on a, uh, you know, in, individually. But uh, when, we, when we unite with other people, like Tom Stammon and, of course, the Gideons, and that gives us a chance to kind of reach out and, and impact uh, others in a way that we otherwise couldn't. So the Gideons will be here, six. June 16th will be two weeks from today. Praise the Lord. And the other thing was I wanted to thank those of you that were able to be here yesterday. Uh, my wife, uh, Mike and Suzanne. Uh, praise the Lord, Ron and uh, John and Sheila. And uh, we got a lot done. We, we didn't do any power washing, and the reason we didn't do any power washing because I was told by the contractor to make it look as bad as possible. Personally. Actually, he just said, don't fix it up. Just leave it like it is until we get all this resolved. So rather than try to make it look pristine when we're trying to get it replaced, we'll just leave it alone until we have the opportunity. But anyway, I wanted to thank all of you very much. Appreciate it. You all worked really hard. Didn't take us that long to do what we did. Uh, but we got this area over here cleaned out with the exception of the hostas. We're going to come back and put mulch in there. I just didn't have room in my truck to haul it all. Uh, and we got that pretty well straightened out, cleaned up out front, got this side uh, cleaned out. We got the mulch put in over here and kill, sprayed for weed or for, uh, yeah, weeds. And uh, so it looks, it's looking better already, and we've got some ideas to do even more things. But the ladies inside did a fantastic job cleaning. They were stretching, and uh, they were getting some exercise at, I could have charged for it had I been a gym instructor or something, but because I'm not, I just had to take it for nothing. But they did a great job cleaning windows, the kitchen area downstairs, all of this. So they did a great job, and I appreciate it all very much. Thank you. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Amen. And so here we are. Two turkey vultures are getting ready to migrate north for the summer, but they're too tired to make the flight on their own, so they decide that uh, they'll just take an airplane. And they're about to board the aircraft, and... Uh, the uh, flight attendant notices that both of these buzzards are carrying uh, armadillos, dead armadillo. Each one of them has an armadillo. And she says, uh, would you like to check those armadillos through as luggage? And they said, no thanks, uh, they're carry-on. <laughs> dead, praise the Lord. Okay, well that went over really well, so we'll try another one. How about the panda walks into a bar and gobbles down some beer nuts, and then he pulls out a gun, fires it in the air, and walks out the door. The bartender jumps up and starts screaming and hollering, and he says, what are you doing, you idiot? And the panda yells back, Google me, I'm a panda, a tree-climbing mammal with distinct black or white coloring, eats, shoots, and leaves. Eats, shoots, and leaves. All right, praise God. This, this can only go up from here. That's why we do this. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay. I want to, uh, I'm going to start in John chapter 1, verse 17. And Suzanne, I've got a lot of scriptures here this morning because it's kind of a, a little bit different than the usual. But I, I just want to say, first of all, this is all prophecy. Every bit of it. There's not one thing in here that isn't prophetic, that isn't prophecy. And uh, I think what we forget a lot of times as Christians is that we are prophets as well as kings and priests. And that's what I'm sensing this last day is all about. I appreciated what, uh, what was said here this morning because, see, we have this gift. It's in us. It's God in us. It's Christ in us. The spirit of prophecy. Yeah. Every word out of God's mouth is prophetic. It's going to happen. Amen. And so here's the deal. We need to understand we have this gift. We need to operate in it. We, know, we need to quit worrying about everything that comes out of our mouth. I'm not talking about swear words and, you know, vulgarity and all that kind of stuff, which may happen from time to time, too, if you get put in the right position. But nevertheless, I'm talking about we instinctively 
spiritually are prophetic. Amen. The things that we say, come, that's why you have to be careful what comes out of your mouth because what you're saying can have an impact. And it will have an impact if you believe it, right? So that's basically where I want to uh, address this scripture from today. So let's begin with John chapter 1 verse 17. He said, for the law was given by Moses, right? We know that God came and gave him the law, right? And so the law was given to man by Moses from God. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. All right, John chapter 17 now, verses 17 through 24. John 17, 17 through 24. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. So what are we in the world for? The same reason Jesus was in the world, to reveal God, right? Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. And I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Praise the Lord. Last scripture here to begin with, at least, Second Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 10. 2 Chronicles 5 and 10. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables which Moses put therein at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. Okay, so when Solomon finished the, uh, the building of the house of the Lord, the priest brought in the ark of the covenant, right? And they placed it in the most holy place. They put it in the holy of holies. All right, now it's important to remember this, that when God gave the law to Moses... There was a cloud covering the whole mountain. Remember, there was lightning thunder. People were scared. They said, you talk to him, he scares us, and so on and so forth. So when God gave those stones to Moses, there was a cloud covering, amen, the mountain. So he gives the, the stone tables, they called them, or tablets, whichever way, however you want to say it. And it says there was nothing in the ark at that time except the two tables of stone. So you didn't have Aaron's rod that had budded. You didn't have the manna. You didn't have anything. There was nothing else in there but the Ten Commandments, basically, in the ark. That's all that was there. Okay? So all, here's the point. Again, this is prophetic now. It's not just history lesson. It's not just about information. This is prophetic. God's trying to tell us something beyond just what's on the surface. What's on the surface is true, and it's worth knowing. But there's something more important beneath the surface in the, the prophetic way that God speaks this and teaches it and tells us. Amen. So the two tables of stone are the only thing in the ark. All they had, in other words, was the law. They had no real vision of God because no man had ever seen him. And there was a cloud. God wouldn't even reveal himself that way. He still covered the place with a cloud and gives him the stone. So all they had was a law with no real vision of God. So they had to kind of develop their understanding of God based on what they understood of the law, which was all distorted to begin with. Amen. And continued on that way. So now let's look again at 2 Chronicles 5, but verses 11 and 12. Now, here's what I want you to try to focus on this morning. I'm not trying to be demeaning or anything here. I'm just saying we need to look at this in a different way. Okay. This is speaking prophetically. We need to read it prophetically. Otherwise, all we're going to get is information. And God's trying to give us something that is spiritual, that is prophetic, because that's the way this is written. All right? So you've got to start looking for yourself. That's what Jesus did. The scripture says he found himself and he began to talk about it. Amen? And that's we, if we're here for the same purpose, we better start finding ourselves instead of start finding religious things and stop finding Jesus and start finding us. Or nothing's going to change. We're just going to continue on in a religious endeavor and to become better people. And that's not God's, that's not his real motive here. Yeah. So it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place 
For all the priests that were present were sanctified and did not then wait by course. Now that's an important thing because the way it worked in Judaism, you had courses. In other words, for one month, this would be these priests would do it. And they, the high priest would come in once a year and do the atonement and all that stuff. But the idea was they went in courses. They went by families. Remember, these are all Cohen's. They're all uh, rabbinical births. They had to be birthed into the Levitical family or the family of Levi. They're called Cohen's, but it's the same thing. They went by courses by the families within the, the Levitical family, right? Well, they didn't hear. In this case, they just all came. Everybody showed up. And it says that also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them, and this is here's critical to Asaph of Heman, of Jedithon, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen. What are we, how are we clothed? In righteousness, in white linen. He, that's how he's seen us, amen. And he says, Our, your robes shall be white as scarlet. Though they're crimson and red with sin, they shall be white as snow. So he's talking, this is talking about us. All right, that's what I'm trying to get to. Being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Okay? Now, in 1 Chronicles, Asaph, Heman, and Jedithan were chosen because of their names, specifically because of their names, not because they were the best priests, not because they were the best looking or the most agilic or agile or the most. Uh, prolific in the way they did their job, they were chosen specifically because of their name. So that tells me immediately, God's trying to tell us something about this situation, and he's using their names to do it. All right? So it's Asaph, Heman, and Jedithan. All right? Look at 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 25 and verse 1. We're going to have to jump around here a little bit just to, to kind of bring some clarity to this. But it says, moreover, David and the captains of the host separated to the service of the sons. Now, these are families, right? Asaph and of Heman and of Jedithan. So it's their children. It's their sons that we're talking about. Who should, what? Prophesy with harps, with psalteries, with cymbals. And another place it says trumpets. And the number of the workmen according to their service was, how, how are they prophesying? With a harp. How are they prophesying with psalteries? And how are they prophesying with cymbals and trumpets? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you how. Because prophecy is something other than what we thought prophecy yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now let's, let's, uh, let's look at this. First Chronicles 16 uh, verses 41 and 42. They were to prophesy with trumpets and all these musical instruments. So with, and with them, Heman, Jedithan, and the rest that were chosen, who were expressed by name, in other words, they were chosen because of their name, amen, because of his mercy endureth forever. And with them, Heman, and they were chosen expressed by name to give thanks to the Lord because his mercy, mercy endureth forever. And with them, Heman, Jedithan, with trumpets and cymbals for those that should make a sound and with musical instruments of God and the sons of Jedithan were porters. So now, with this, hopefully I've explained it enough that you understand what I'm saying. Now we can look at 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 11 and 12 in this context. So let's go back to uh, for, uh, 2 Chronicles 5, verses 12, 11 and 12. In verse 12 it said... It came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified. They were chosen by course. They were, they were just families. All of, everybody showed up. Also the Levites, which were the singers. And the reason for that is we, we don't have a hierarchy. This, the reason why that's put there is not so that we know that these priests weren't being called out by their family name or by their, uh, by their turn at the ministry. Right? They were called out. They just, everybody showed up. All right? It's us. It's just whoever, whosoever will shows up, and they, they're given something to do. They're given a thing. So, and when the heathen Jephthah, and it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were there were present were sanctified, and did not then wait by course. Also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them, of Asaph, of Haman, 
and a Jedithan with their sons and their brethren being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them 120 priests sounding the trumpets. All right, just leave that there for a second. Now, here's the deal. Asaph means gatherer. Gatherer. Heman means faithful. And Jedithan means praising. So here's what you've got. The gatherer of the faithful is praising God. We're talking about Jesus. This is, the, this is the prophetic picture that God is showing us. Amen. The high priest, Jesus, the gatherer of the faithful, praising God with sons and brethren arrayed in white linen. This is us. Amen. Having cymbals, psalteries, and harps as the 120 priests prophesied with their trumpets. Yeah. Praise the Lord. 1 yeah. Corinthians chapter 14 uh, verses 1 through 5. I may get excited because I know where, where this is going. This has been on me for a while. And I'm telling you, I'm feeling things that, I, that are different. Amen. And it isn't about numbers. I mean, if that were the case, we'd look out and we'd say, well, you know, what's the point here? Let's have a prayer and go home. We're, we're doing what we're doing if, the same as if there were 20 people or 2,000 or 20,000 because that's what God's expecting. And he's not measuring this by a certain group or a certain thing. He's measuring by whoever will. That's who he's using. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. So follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. But rather that you may prophesy. That's way up there. It's the top of the list. And this is God speaking prophetically to the church that will be. Amen. And for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaks not to men but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mystery. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself. But he that prophesies edifies the church, the body. I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you prophesy. For greater is he that prophesies than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Now look at verse 39. Wherefore, brethren, this is after all this that Paul's talking about prophecy, covet to prophesy. Yeah, Something the, the, the Ten Commandments tells you don't covet. And Paul's saying, forget that stuff. Covet. You want to covet something? Yeah. Covet to prophesy. That ought to be your, your greatest hunger, your greatest desire. Amen? And forbid not to speak with tongues. Alright, so here's the deal. Second Chronicles 5, let's, let's look at this quickly. Second Chronicles again, uh, chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. <coughs> now, if we do this, if we do what Paul's suggesting, he's not suggesting, he's, he's wanting to force this. He's wanting to get people to do this because he's telling them, this is the most important thing you're ever going to do. You need to covet it. You need to hunger after it. You need to desire it. You need to be jealous of it. You need to want it, you know, desperately. So it came even to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound, to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. Now what did we find out? This is, this, he called it prophecy. How does prophecy work? Well, to make one sound. What happens in here, this is amazing to me. Other people may look at this and go, geez, what a weird group, you know, and they're all talking about stuff, and you know, what good is it? We're sounding like one voice. Because if you listen to the things that are said, there's always echoes. There's always a witness. Somehow, some way, it just keeps coming back. Why? Because it's by the Spirit. It's, yeah. it, it, it's how it happens and how it's worked. Yeah. It, it's how it works. So in praising and thanking the Lord, and when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets, their voice with the trumpets, remember John? He said, I heard a voice behind me. It was a trumpet. He heard a prophetic voice. Of course, he did. It was Jesus, the Spirit of prophecy. So here he says, he heard the trumpet. And the symbols and instruments of music, and praise the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. That then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Why? Because people were prophesying, they were pro being prophetic. Praise the Lord. The, this is the prophetic implications that God's trying to give us. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4. 
And this isn't, you know, we thought it was, thus saith the Lord, you know, two years from now, something's going to happen, you're going to have this, or some bad thing's going to That's not prophecy. I mean, I suppose it could be interpreted that way, but prophecy is simply saying yes to whatever God said. If God said it, then I'm going to repeat it. They're simply praising God because His mercy endureth forever. And they're not saying one word, but they're agreeing with God. And He said, that's prophecy. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with Him in glory. What happens when God shows up to these people that are prophesying. The glory fills the place. They can't do anything and God does it all. Yeah. We've been trying to get prophetic things going on here so that I can do something. This isn't about that. This is about the prophecy is that I'm going to agree with God and that God's going to do what only God can do. And He'll do it the, as soon as I agree with Him, as soon as I refuse to be separated from that reality. When I quit letting my physical body, my own mind, like all of us do, just as John was, or Don was saying, we all go through this, you know we do, and struggle with our failures and the last stupid thing that we did and the last moment of just impulse caused me to say something or do something, you know, whatever, and then feel like, okay, well, I'm written off. God's never going to use me again. No, it's not that at all. It's agreeing with God's what He's looking for. That's what He calls prophecy. Why? Because... This word is all prophecy. And when I agree with this word, I'm being prophetic. I can't help but be. So when Christ who is our life shall appear, then you also will appear with him in that glory cloud. All right? Praise the Lord. Romans chapter 8 and verses 17 and 18. And I want to try to emphasize how simple this is. Just like the friend <clears throat> we're talking about this morning, when you mentioned your granddaughter's girlfriend, she doesn't know she's being prophetic. Mm -hmm. It's just in her to be prophetic. Yes. Children are innocent. Yes. They have not reached the age of accountability. They're not being judged anyway. Now, we want them to... Be you know, trusting Christ to be born again, obviously. But when they're young, they have it innately. They do things that are spiritual. And we see, you, know, you know, you see it with your own grandkids because you see some stuff that looks like it may have come from the other direction sometimes too. But you know what I mean? They, they, they can be prophetic without knowing it because they're not trying to be. They're not thinking about it. They're just It just flows through them. Yeah. So that the children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The suffering is not talking about physical pain. and, and It's the not seeing the manifestation. It's the suffering is the not seeing the reality of what the scripture tells us. Isn't that what we've been talking about? How frustrated does it get when somebody you pray for, you know what the Word of God says, that my brother, my sister, you know, Don's brother, all of us have got somebody that we've loved and, and, and been close to and connected with, and we prayed and we believed God and we did what we thought we were supposed to do and we did everything that we thought we should do, and they still died. Praise the Lord. So that suffering of the present is not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed. Now look at this. In us. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right. Colossians 1 verse 27. Is, we use this all the time. But it's this great mystery. That is Christ in you. The hope of glory. <laughs> Here's the deal. That God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery. Among the Gentiles. Which is Christ in you. The hope of this glory that they're talking about. Right. The glory of God is coming on the church or the house of God. Praise the Lord. I'm talking about 2 Chronicles chapter 5 now. And we're seeing it now spoken in the New Testament because Paul is looking at this thing prophetically. He's not, talk, he's not trying to give us a history lesson. Oh, you know what happened back there? No, he's just saying it the way that it actually is. Because he has this understanding of the prophetic. All right, 2 Peter chapter 1, 18, verse 18 through 21. 2 Peter 
chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. So our God is a personal God. Yes. And he wants intimacy with individuals. Yes. Not just awareness of of humanity as a race. In other words, he doesn't just want people to know that he exists. He wants intimacy with those same people. Amen. Hebrews 1 and uh, 1 and 2 says, you know, in the times past, God has spoken to us by the prophets. Amen. Who sundry times and divers man have spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Hath in these last days. Spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So Jesus, Jesus was like, uh, he was like heaven's thoughts. Right? So it's another way of saying, he's God. He just happens to be in the flesh. So he is heaven's thoughts. He, he's the... He's the words of heaven. He's the principles of heaven. He's the plans of heaven. He's the pattern of living in heaven. Yes. Amen. And he's made visual and verbal. He visually and verbally manifested this on earth. What's in heaven? How heaven looks. How heaven acts. How heaven works. How, how, how the reality of it. And by that, by that act... Jesus rent the veil. That's how he did it. By revealing God. That's just He's just showing us symbolically. I pulled back the veil. Wow. There he is. And that's how Jesus pulled back the veil. By showing us God. Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord. He made the way for God to come and dwell personally within each one of us. Yes. Yes. Woo! Hallelujah. You may not get excited, but I'm telling you. This goes way back for me, hallelujah. And Jesus was the beginning of a whole new race of God-created beings. Now look, I, I, when I was in another organization and where I was ordained and all that stuff, we did a lot of study. And y'all that were in that group know what I'm talking about. But we dispensational truths were a big thing. I mean, all the way back to, to Genesis and you go all the way down through the dispensation, I heard somebody talking about this morning is what brought it to my mind. But the truth is, we live in the dispensation of grace. Yeah. Amen. God's favor. It's not, we're not living in any other, no other works of other dispensations will work in this dispensation. The only thing that will work in this dispensation is, get, is grace, is operating from grace or acceptance by God. Amen. Now, look at Revelation 19 and verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Praise the Lord. Jesus, the firstborn among many brethren, the prototype of a whole new creation, amen, in Christ, who would become like him. Being conformed to his image and his likeness. Right? Well, image-wise, we're conformed because we're physical. We have two ears, two arms, two legs, you know. We're, that's, that's conforming to that. But there's also a conforming to his likeness. What's his likeness? The spirit of prophecy. Something that always agrees with God. That never says anything but what my Father says. That never does anything but what my Father does, says. Yes. Amen. Amen. So, after a Jesus, after Jesus ascended bodily to heaven, the world could no longer see the fullness of God in the flesh. Right? Because that's what he was here for. When he left, you couldn't see it anymore. 
But Jesus sent us the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us. The same Spirit that was in its fullness in Him. And we have that same fullness, He tells us. So Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit will reveal Scripture. Right? That's what He tells us. Because Scripture is sufficient to give us knowledge of all that we need to have and be here in our lifetime, in mortality, and on into eternity. This will tell you everything you're ever going to need. Ever, ever going to need. The Bible is now the revelation of God. Praise the Lord. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word became God. The Word dwelled among us. We beheld His glory. Glory is the only begotten of the Father. Amen. And we believe. His Word. He was the Word before the Word became flesh. And after the flesh went back to the Spirit. Now He's still a body. There's still a body in heaven. I'm just saying it's a spiritual body now. Where before it was a physical body. Same kind of body we're all going to get one day. Amen. So, today, look, look at John 1, uh, verse 14 through 18. So the Bible is the true unadulterated revelation of God since Jesus went. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, grace for grace. You have all of God there is. Yeah, I know it doesn't make sense naturally because we want to do it mathematically and it doesn't work that way. But you have the fullness of the Godhead in you, and yet so does Sally, so does Don, so does John, so does she. Everybody. Plus, he's everywhere else. Yes. How to get your head around that, I don't know. But that, that's the truth. That's the reality of it. You don't have to understand it to believe it. So, of his fullness of all we received, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now listen to this. This is just to throw something out there to upset somebody. I suppose no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Yes. Nobody's seen God but God. You can't say Jesus saw God. No, God saw God and He just called Him Jesus. He just named Him Jesus. Hear O Israel, the Shema. Hear O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Yes, there are manifestations. We understand that. But he's still just one God. And to start separating him will just cause more confusion than you're ever going to be able to handle. I'm not trying to get into, you know, I'm not really interested in trying to force people to believe something just because I believe it. I'm just saying this is the reality. And the, the simpler you make it, the clearer and the more precise it is, and the easier it is to work from. Praise the Lord. So today, through the Bible... And the Holy Spirit, God wants to walk and talk with us in an individual, personal intimacy. And here's the deal. Too many Christians don't understand how to recognize the voice of God. And even, even when they do recognize it, they don't know how to respond to it so it can be fulfilled. So God has established the gift of prophecy as His voice in the midst of congregations. <clears throat> he has sent the spirit of prophecy to give testimony of Jesus throughout the earth. That's our function. That's what we're supposed to be doing. The prophet Joel prophesied of the church age. Amen. Look at Joel chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. Now here's what's going to happen when you get born again. That's what he's telling us. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him, right? 2.27, And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward. 
that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. This is after he has got Israel together, right? And made them a, a nation, right? And afterwards, after that, it will come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will sh shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Okay. And it goes on. And then in Acts chapter 2, look at verses 16 and 17. Acts 2, verses 16 and 17. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is on the day of Pentecost, right? This prophetic word that they had known, now it's going to manifest. And he recognizes this is that. This is what he was talking about. This is that prophecy, amen, that came to us. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons, your daughters, and prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Now, what did he do? He just flipped the whole scene. Yeah. Mm. Right? Wasn't it old men that were prophesying before? In other words, what he's saying is everybody's got a part in this. There's no, you know, old men are the only ones going to prophesy. No. Look, young, yeah. out of the mouth of yeah. babes and sucklings, truth will come. Prophecy can come from anywhere. Because of the covenant that we're in. Because of the dispensation that we're in. Yes. Praise the Lord. So what, this is what Paul was emphasizing in verse 39 when he said, Covet. Covet. Because this is what y'all are about. You, don't, you may not know it, but this is your whole purpose in being is to prophesy. So covet. Covet the prophesy. Mm -hmm. Amen. Prophecy brings illumination. And more specifics about what is already written. In other words, when we prophecy not only gives us information or out of this, but it gives us specifics about the information. Amen. And we, we just kind of read through it, but the Holy Spirit in Christ is the gift of prophecy through us. Jesus Christ is the gift of prophecy, right? The spirit of prophecy is what it talks about. What is the Holy Spirit? The spirit of Christ, the spirit of God. So what does the, spirit of, uh, the Holy Spirit do? It does the same thing it did in Jesus. It does the same thing it did before Jesus was in the flesh. It prophesies. It says what God says. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. And it says it through us. That's bringing... What? How, why? Because it brings edification, exhortation, and comfort to the church, to the body. Praise the Lord. John 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. Amen. He's going to make it real to you. The Word of God is going to come alive. The Word of God is going to be prophetic again. Amen? So the Holy Spirit speaking the thoughts of Christ within us. Are you listening to me? That's what He's doing. The Holy Spirit is speaking the thoughts of Jesus in us, in believers. Amen? And that is obviously God's order for communication. That's how He wants to communicate. Praise the Lord. Amen. And whatever is sensed in the Spirit has to be then confirmed. Amen. Y'all, we all get senses. We all get things that, I think that's the Lord. I think that's, you know, I've gotten this thing and it won't leave me alone. And I had a dream or I had this or the other and it just keeps coming back. And I believe it's God. It must be the Lord. Amen. If it is, I can confirm it. I can find out if it's God. Right? All I got to do is go back here. And it'll be here somewhere. It may not be in the exact same words because he's speaking to me through my mind, through my spirit, and through my mind. So I'm going to, you know, sort things out. It's like when you hear uh, tongues and interpretation. Y'all y'all better, you know, get right with the Lord because God's coming after you. I mean, you know, God doesn't have a southern accent. He doesn't have an accent at all that I'm aware of, but you know what I mean. We have a tendency to then say, well, I want the Lord because I know he's not from Alabama. You know, come on. But it's us. We are the receptacle and we are the, the thing that releases it. Amen. And so it's what, it's, it, that's God's order of communication. That's the way he plans to communicate. Now you can try to communicate any way you want to, but you're going to be talking to yourself. 
Because this is how God talks. This is how He communicates. And whatever is sensed in the Spirit then has to be confirmed. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. So if it's sensed in the Spirit, it has to be confirmed. Now I want to this is what I want to say. That's how this is why this is so important. And I get stuff all the time from people that say, you know, that's you, you ought to just do away with that. And come on, just get on, make it like a regular church service, because that that kind of bothers people. You know, visitors get uncomfortable with us sharing. Because they why? Because they want a regular church service. They, they just want to come in and yeah. do this and do that and then get up and walk out and we're well, I've fulfilled my obligation and it's cool. I don't want to have to get uncomfortable listening to prophetic words coming from people that I don't know. But that's what's happening here, whether we understand it or not. This is the third time I'm coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Shall every word be established? I told you before and foretell you, as if I were present the second time. And being answered now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned. And to all that, if I come again, I will not spare. Praise the Lord. Yes. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, this is Paul talking, which is to you were not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Praise the Lord. Examine yourselves. Whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you? Except you be reprobates. So you have this gift. You have this ability. Amen. This is critical. This, this is the critical role. Amen. Of the body. To fulfill the prophetic voice. What we're doing. Is absolutely biblical. Whether anybody understands it or not. We're proving a biblical voice. Why? Because every time it happens. With rare exceptions. There is continuity. There is echoing. There is uh, you know, what he calls evidence, or out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter is established. Out of witnesses, there's several witnesses. Every time something is said, you'll always get at least two or three witnesses here in this little group. Why? Because God's saying, this is prophetic. Listen up. That may be Sheila. You may not think Sheila's that spiritual. Hey, this, this is, you know, I know what I'm saying. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying so other people can make decisions and they can make you know, right? <laughs> oh, Debbie, I'm, you're, in this, you're in this too. No, I'm just saying. My point is this. Doesn't matter what you think. God's using them prophetically. And if you're not wise enough to tap into it and take advantage of it, you're missing the one thing God wants to use to communicate to you with. And it will validate and verify the things that you've already been thinking that you were kind of intimidated about saying. So somebody else will say it and say, God will say, see? Yeah. Yeah. You, you knew. You knew, but you just wouldn't do it. Yeah. You're like the parrot. You know. You know what I mean. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Examine yourself. Except you be reprobates. Praise the Lord. This... This is the role of the church. This is, our, this is what we're here for. And we, we push it off like, oh, come on, that's just, that's uncomfortable. Hey, this is what we're here for. If we're not going to do this, zap us, get us out of here now, we just will move on. That's why we feel like, what's my purpose? What am I supposed to be doing? Why should I want my Well, because you're not doing what it is you are here for. So you're going to find all kinds of other things to fill in those gaps to try to make you feel like you're complete or fulfilled. But you never will be. Until you do the one thing that he's asking us to do. And that's communicate. Let me talk to you. Listen to me. There, he's no respecter of persons. He wants Don to speak for him. He wants Sheila to speak for him. He wants... Every one of us, he wants us to be his mouthpiece. He wants us to be the prophetic witness of his reality. Yes. And I believe that this is the time that God is raising up and conforming us to Jesus. 
the anointed. Not in our perfection in terms of we're already perfect as far as God's concerned. So we, we get into dialogues and monologues with ourselves over the fact that I'm not like Jesus. No, you are exactly like yes. Jesus as far as God is concerned. Praise the Lord. We want to measure ourselves among ourselves and judge ourselves by ourselves. And he said, that is not wise. You won't get where you want to go by doing that. Now, it's counterintuitive to a human to think that it is what it is. I mean, that's what we all say, isn't it? Well, yeah, it's just what it is. You got to live with it. No, you don't. You're just settling for something less than what God wants for you. Yeah. Amen? So I think God is doing this right now. Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. And that's why we're experiencing so much, I, th I think it may be, I don't want to call it frustration, but a sense of not arrived, having a root arrived. Yeah. When in fact we have arrived, we're just not doing what we should do where we are. Right. So I am crucified with Christ. This is, again, this is Paul, what is this? Cut a prophecy. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it's not I, but Christ liveth in me. <coughs> and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't frustrate the grace of God. In other words, I'm, not, I'm through trying to be the Pharisee of Pharisees. I'm not going to frustrate the grace of God. For if the righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. He died for nothing. You are the righteousness of God. You, you have every reason to know and believe that God wants to use you and use you mightily, but he has to do it his way. He won't, he won't alter the plan to fit our humanity. Right. Our humanity has to be altered to fit the divine. Mm. We have to wake up to the fact that we, our true identity is divinity, mm. not humanity. Mm. Praise the Lord. We've got Jesus. We've got the Spirit. Or the anointing of prophecy. If we've got Jesus, we've got the spirit of prophecy. You can't have one without the other. Yeah. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul said, uh, he was explaining to him that they had been birthed and built on the foundational ministries of the gospels, or the gospel, and prophets. He's saying, look guys, I don't know why you're acting the way you're acting. You were founded on this reality of prophecy. Mm. And at several places, the Corinthians, they talk, they, people are talking in tongues, they're having, you know, just hoo-hahs all over the place in the church, and nobody's knowing what's going on because it's all tongues. And that's where he brought up the fact that, look, look, here's what you need. Tongues is good, but it's only for you. What you need is prophecy. Then you can minister. Then God has access. Then God can do what God can do. In fact, if you start prophesying, God will show up and you won't be able to do anything because he'll fill the church yeah. with his presence so that you cannot minister. All you can do is release him. That's what he wants. That's what he means by not sharing his glory with another. He says, I'm not. You and I are one. Yes. If you'll stop letting your flesh, your physical person, try to dominate this thing, then you and I, the oneness that we have, will be revealed. And you will share my glory. The hope of glory. Yes. Christ in you. Praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 2, 19 through 22. I, you know, I'm telling you, as the closer we get, and I, I almost hate to even use time and distance and space, but the more this reality is going to happen. I mean, it's going to happen, and somebody yeah. is going to start doing it. Somebody's just going to say, hey, the rest of this stuff, okay, I get it, it's good, but it's not what God's trying to get across to us. It's, it's still a, a, a kind of a bleeding back of religion. Mm -hmm. It's hard to let go. Mm -hmm. I mean, get into some, there's all kinds of things, and it's hard to let go of those things because there's a comfort in it. There's a sense of belonging and purpose, and it's okay because everybody else thinks that way, so I must be all right. If you look at Jesus' life and his, and his apostles and the disciples, they were not in the mainstream. They were ridiculed. They were, they were not, they were long-haired, Hawaiian shirt-wearing, looked more like the Grateful Dead than the...
glorious gospel, you know. That's what the guy told me. He said, look at this. He said, wow, I can't believe it. And now he's got, he's 40 years old probably, right? Wouldn't you think? And, but he pulls out his big, you know, the phones. And, look. And he's got a picture of this guy from the Grateful Dead. And I'm looking at him. I'm thinking, did he take that picture of me? What is this about? And why are you carrying around a picture of the Grateful Dead hoping to run into one? I'm crazy. Now, I'm not saying, you know, long hair, short hair, you know what I mean, Hawaiian shirts or, you know, Brooks Brothers. Doesn't matter. That's not the point. The point is God is not that interested in this. It's what's inside. And we've made it all about this so that whenever we deviate from that, everybody gets freaked out. I mean, I've got to tell you, I've, just personally, I haven't said anything to, to Sally other than I was going to get my hair cut a while back. She said, well, I don't know, I like it, so it looks all right to me long. But I think, you know, this is what goes on in my mind. This is just what we're talking about, right? People are thinking you're, being, you're weird. You're, you know, you're getting too far out there. You're getting too strange. You're getting, you know, you're looking, what is a 71-year-old man running around looking like that for? And, Ah, you know, it might be just as bad if I shaved it all off. Yes. It might be worse. It's been a number of years since I've seen myself without a beard. And I'm guessing there's some crevices and lines and things that weren't there before. I don't want to find out. I'm good with this. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So that's all I'm saying. But now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. This is what we were built on. Well, we got built on it, and then it's like we moved the house. It's like Texas flip and move or something that we've been doing. Well, we go buy some old dump, renovate it, and we got no place to put it. Praise the Lord. <laughs> we have the spirit of prophecy in us, living in us. Amen. Uh, in whom all the building fitly framed together grow up into a holy temple. Of the Lord. Remember where we started out in, in Chronicles? In the temple where God shows up because these people there are prophesying. And God shows up and fills the temple to the point where they can't do anymore except just be there and watch God move. In whom ye also are building together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 6 now. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, which is the dispensation of grace that we're talking about here, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. He's talking about the prophetic, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Because then only a prophet or only a priest would get the anointing, the prophetic or the... Remember when uh, Saul, when, when the Spirit came on him, he began to prophesy. Right? Now Saul was not the kind of person you would generally think of as being prophetic. Right? He was a coward, for one thing, to begin with. He was shy. He was kind of inhibited and uh, 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 insecure until he got a few years into power, and then he changed all that. But the truth is, when the Spirit came on, and they immediately, what did they do? They did what the Spirit's general and specific intent always is, and that's to be prophetic. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, and is now revealed, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So he's saying, read this and you'll understand how, why I'm coming at you this way. Why I'm approaching you this way. Amen? So, Paul justified his teaching, not only with the Old Testament, the scriptures that they had at the time. He didn't just, not only did he use those, but he also... He had an authority of the spirit of revelation, right? Because the New Testament had not been written. It was being written as he wrote the letters, right? So he not only used the authority of the Old Testament, he used the authority of revelation of the Old Testament to validate what he was teaching them here because it didn't sound quite the same to them. 
And he's saying you, the problem is because you don't understand the spirit of prophecy. So uh, I, I'm not saying we need to write new scriptures. Paul never, th this is a different thing altogether. The Bible is complete. But the Bible was prophetically inspired. Right? Let's just stay with me. So, you know, it, it requires prophetic Holy Spirit illumination and revelation to understand and apply it correctly. <laughs> I know you think, well, come on, really? Yeah, really. That's why we have 10,000 denominations. Because 99.9% .9 of this is being read as history or as a liturgical kind of way of setting things up so that people just go out and set up some religion and say, well, we're, we're closer to it because we've seen something here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Praise the Lord. Look, this, here's a perfect example. Martin Luther, he read the scripture, the just shall live by faith, right? And Ephesians 2, 8, 8 and 9, he read it hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times. He was a Catholic priest. He'd been all through the, 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 you know, the priesthood, the, the school, the, the, the whole thing. And he had been a priest for years. So you know he'd read it. He, he'd read it. He'd thought about it. He'd seen it. He, he talked about it. He probably preached about it, right? He had all of that information before he ever had any revelation. He was reading it as truth but not prophetic truth, just truth. And then, the spirit of revelation comes on him, and it made it known to him what God was actually saying when he said the just shall live by faith. When it did dawn on him, it ushered in the Protestant revolution. Hundred thousands of times he read it, and then all of a sudden, the yeah. prophetic word came to him by revelation, and he saw what the prophetic word was that God was really trying to say, not just the stuff that was on the page, but what God was really trying to communicate. True revelation, and I, I, I'm telling you, true revelation always brings revolutionary change in an individual, or in a group of believers, or anything else. That's why people say, oh, I know what you're talking about, but they're not experiencing that. So I know, no matter what you tell me, you don't have revelation yet. You've got some information, but it hasn't become prophetic to you. It hasn't become something that has resonated inside of you yet, or it would begin to do what it's supposed to do. I mean, I do, I'm not saying, okay, because I got all this, y'all better catch up. No, I'm saying I'm just exactly like you. It, we, we, this is the battle. This is the struggle against the flesh. I want reason. I want logic. I want historic evidence. I want now evidence. But God said, that ain't the way I communicate, fella. Sorry. I communicate by the spirit of prophecy that's already in you. And if you're not going to act on that, then you're stuck with whatever else you can come up with. And that's where the church has been for 2,000 years. Martin Luther didn't invent prophecy. Nor did he, he didn't invent that scripture. He didn't, he didn't prophesy new scriptures. Right? He just got a revelation of the one that was in front of him, and when he spoke it, it was prophetic because it was right out of the mouth of God. And that's why it created a revolutionary change. Why? Because the glory filled the house. Martin Luther couldn't minister anymore. God moved and turned that whole system upside down. What he got was a revelation of what was already written by some prophet back through the years that God had spoken to who heard what God said and wrote it down without any guarantee that whoever the next reader was would have the same understanding. That's why God said, Jesus said, you've got to be born again. Because you'll never get this. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how kind. But if you don't get the spirit of God, this word's never going to mean any more to you than a history book yeah. Yeah. or a textbook of some kind. 
and it's true of every movement. When we, the scriptures we're reading today, the Holy Spirit will illuminate and activate into full reality when we receive the prophetic truth of it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There's stuff here that we've read over and over. Sometimes maybe we read it and just go, oh, well, yeah, that was from back then. This is 2019. You know, I mean, things have changed. And how that? No. When we read it and believe it and the spirit of prophecy illuminates it to us, it becomes the reality for us. Every one of us has experienced this somehow. I mean, the fundamental one is, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that he died for my sins. That is a prophetic word that comes right out of the mouth of God. And until you believe it, until it's really resonated into you, until it's real to you, you won't act on it. The moment you act on it, bam, it's done. Praise the Lord. All right. There have been uh, approximately four major restorations. I'm not going to go into all of it the movements, the charismatic, all these different things that have gone on. They happen over the last 500 years, and then there's been some smaller waves of restoration of truth in between. But here's the deal. Each time one of those happens, somebody had a prophetic understanding and acted on it. Now, let me tell you something. You think about Azusa Street and some of these things. These were not popular people at the time. In fact, in many circles, they're still not popular. But the truth is, they had a revelation some women in Kansas, what were they doing? They were looking at the book of Acts. They read it hundreds of times. Their pastors had preached it to them. Their Sunday school classes had talked about it. But all of a sudden, some women are getting together for a little Bible study, and they're reading Acts. And all of a sudden, one of them says, wait a minute. I think this is for today. I think we can experience this now. It wasn't just for them. It was for whosoever will. It was for everybody. Right? He was going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. And what happened? They all received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was the beginning of the whole Pentecostal movement that eventually ended up in Southern California, Azusa Street, and so on and so forth, and then around the world. Why? Because some common, everyday, normal people got the spirit of prophecy and decided to act on it. It's happened over and over, but those are, there are like four or five major ones. But look at this now again in, in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. And again, all of us have had some restorational truths ourselves. We've had prophetic uh, whisperings, if you will, from God. It's caused us to act in a certain way. But we don't, we're not consistent. We just think, well, that was a fluke. That was just weird. Whoa, God talked to me. Let me stand up and give you a testimony. Now he's talking to everybody. The only problem is most of us aren't listening. Yeah. Or we're listening the wrong way. So the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Not what the Holy Spirit is doing in these last days will bring revelation and activation, the greatest, I'm telling you, I believe this, the greatest restorational movement that has ever been recorded. It'll get us back to where we were supposed to be in the very beginning. Where they didn't even know for sure where they were at and what they were doing. Praise the Lord. It'll be greater than every previous movement rolled into one. It will. It has to be to do what the Scripture says it's going to do. It will be as revolutionary as the change from Judaism to Christianity. That's good because I'm telling you, what we call Christianity is not what God's talking about. It, it will seem that dramatic to be changed from Lutheran, Baptist, Pentecostal, whatever it is, to this prophetic person connected with God. It will be as great a revolutionary change as it was leaving uh, Judaism for Christianity. Because I'm going to tell you something. Most Christian churches are not that far removed from Judaism. Now, I know I'm not talking about the animal sacrifice, but I'm talking about the legalism or the law that they were con completely controlled by. Yep. And, never, and the reason for that was they talk about it. Paul talks about it. We've already read it in a different context, but that the law always puts a veil over God. Mm -hmm. It's like Moses getting the Ten Commandments again. And this is supposed to open it up. It's supposed to make him 
available and, and, and intimate with us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We think, man, what would it have been like to be there in the book of Acts? I'm telling you what, the people in the book of Acts are looking down here saying, oh gosh, I wish I could have been there for that. I know what's coming, man. It's going to make us look like a Sunday school picnic. It's going to be nothing compared to what God's got planned for them. Because they know the end from the beginning. Amen. They're in the place where prophecy begins yeah. and ends. Amen. As the final revelation on the last scriptures to be fulfilled or illuminated. When it starts happening, and I think we're there now because I, I mean, we're seeing things and hearing things that I never dreamed of. And I'm not saying I was a great scholar or a theologian by any means, but I thought I had some stuff together at one point. But I'm telling you, what I have learned in the last 15, 20 years, and I'm still a long ways from where I you know, expect God wants to take us. But I've seen it. I mean, I've seen Revelation come. I've seen the prophetic come and say something that I believe so strongly. And at one point, I would have probably given my life to defend it. Yes. Only to find out about 75% of it was not true. It wasn't prophetic. The prophetic part, I still got. I'm still hanging on. I'm not letting go of that. It came from God. The rest of the stuff came from some group, amen, that wanted to make up a church, a denomination. And I get it. That's what everybody's been doing for 2,000 years. You think, well, we got away from the Catholic Church. No, you just got a, a, a mini Catholic Church. It's like when we, when we came over here, we had a lot of people coming from the old organization. Not all necessarily from the same church, but from the same organization. And uh, they thought they were going to get that UPC light. That's what they were after. You know, L-I-T-E. They wanted the they're not, you know, just cut some of the stuff out, but leave the rest. I mean, we would like some of it. It makes us feel like we're better than other people. But some of it is annoying. So we want to get rid of that, but we want to keep some of the other stuff. John set them right up, though. Because a couple of them asked him, they said one time, we were putting in these scan lights and stuff in here. And a couple of them asked John one day, he said, uh, does your pastor, uh, is he a, uh, what, how, did, how was it he put it, uh, in yeah, does he believe in standards? That was it, yeah. Standards. Standards, standards yeah. And John said, oh man, he barely has any morals. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he told him. He said, standards? He hardly has any morals. Of course, there was, a, there was quite a decline in uh, attendance there shortly after that, but I never held it against John, personally. It's my own fault, praise the Lord. <laughs> But you understand what I'm saying? I mean, it's all, he was right. He took the other extreme. I mean, if you're going to be that stupid, you know, how about this? He, he hardly has any morals. What are you worried about standards? Well, the truth is it's true of all of us. You're worried about what kind, what kind of rules is he going to preach to us? I mean, if I, I had guys tell me, hey, don't you care about us? I said, what, what are you talking about? Don't care about You never preach about hell. I said, well, I don't plan on going there, and I don't know why you need to know anything about some place you're never going to go. I mean, I don't need a roadmap to Indochina. I ain't going. I mean, I don't, know how to, I don't need to know how to get there, and I don't need to know what goes on over there. I ain't going there. Praise the Lord. Hmm. This thing, when these final revelations and, and prophetic truths start to come out, and when they become illuminated and activated, and they won't become activated until they are illuminated, until we can activate them by faith, amen? It'll create a tidal wave yeah. of restoration, such proportions yes. that we have no thoughts of. But it hasn't even entered into your mind yet, the things that I want to do. Yes. Praise the Lord, but it has entered into your spirit. And that's the thing that makes you sit on the edge of your seat hoping today is the day for miracles. Today is the day I'm going to experience this reality. Amen? Amen. Eleven, uh, Revelation 11 and verse 15. Now 
No, he said the, the seventh angel sounded, and there, there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Praise the Lord. So the whole body of Christ will only be built up to the full stature, like it talks about in Ephesians, and maturity in Christ as the body of Christ is functioning fully by the Spirit. It don't happen by, by osmosis or just longevity. I mean, if, if people are here on the planet long enough, eventually God will bring them into the full... No, every generation has their opportunity. Praise the Lord. And I believe because as time moves... And I, I know we shouldn't even talk about time, but I'm talking about from a spiritual perspective. It's like this. It's not a timeline. It's tapered. It's like, a, it's like a funnel that squeezes us into that last place with such pressure. That it impact. You know how it is. Take a water hose. And it's just dripping off the end of the hose. Stick your thumb over it. Put some pressure on it. And that thing will it'll, it'll wash the bug off the side of your house. Amen? And that's what I'm saying. That's what happens. With God, we, we are being pressed. Yeah. Right? We're being pressed into this final little hole that is going to be like God. Out here, well, there's some good God stuff in there. And there's some good positive behavior and lots of stuff and then it slowly, gradually begins to come down to what God is really interested in and only what God is interested in and that's when you get the pressure that begins to have an impact on whatever it comes in contact with. And that's where I think we are. That's where we're on the very verge of this right now. And that's why God is setting up. I mean, I believe that's why the, the message of grace came along. Because we could never get to where God wanted us as long as we're, because we're still struggling with our own flesh. And God knows until we get past that, we can never get into the intimacy that he really wants with us because we always feel guilty. We always feel ashamed. We always feel, right? How you have an argument or you do something or you fail somebody, it's hard to just be, <laughs> well, praise the Lord, it's all good, isn't it? Right? Yeah. Hallelujah. No, you got to wait. You got to go through the whole thing. Mm. And they get over, maybe they'll forget it. Or maybe you can apologize enough to get them to get past it. That's not what God's after. God has already declared us perfect, righteous, Holy, he's saying, now get on the same page with me, and we can wrap this baby up and get out of here. Praise the Lord. All right. Ephesians 4, verse 16. I'm about done. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 4, 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto edifying of itself in love. How do you edify? Prophecy. What do we do? That's, this is, that's, a, that's like a description of this. What we do every Sunday before church. It's prophetic. We not, you might not define it as prophetic, but that's only because you don't know the true definition of what it is you're doing. He said, this is what will work. This will make, this will edify. This will bring prophetic truth to the body. Praise the Lord. John 16, uh, verses 7. Verse 7. John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. This is Jesus, the spirit of prophecy, right? He said, now I know it doesn't seem like it, but it's, it's for your benefit, it's expedient, or it's going to help you to do what it is you need to do if I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter won't come, or the spirit won't come unto you. But if I depart, I'll send him to you. Praise the Lord. Verse 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. In other words, whatever God's saying, that's what he's going to say. It's, it's pristine prophecy. Nothing to screw it up. And he will show you things to come. Now, <laughs> praise the Lord. Think of the context of this. Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross, right? And he says, now, I know you don't want me to go, but the truth is it's going to be to your benefit so that you can fulfill the call on your life that was on my life. For me to go so that, that you can have the spirit that I've got. Because you can't do this without, right? So the whole body of Christ will only be built up to the full stature and the maturity in Christ as the body of Christ is functioning fully in and by the spirit. Praise the Lord. 
Look, no, I, I, no, let me just give you. Here's the deal. Christ can't return. He can't. He can't return until his ascension gifts, that's what he's talking about here by going away. I must go. He's saying, because if I go, there are gifts that will come as a result of my ascending back to heaven. And it's the Holy Spirit. It's the gift of prophecy. It's the whole thing, right? So he said, I can't, I, he, if he returns before the ascension gifts ministries have brought the church into full stature, then he's lying. These ascension gifts were for a purpose. The purpose was to bring the church to the full stature of Christ. And we haven't done a thing with most of them. Yeah. In fact, there's whole, whole denominations that don't believe in any of them. Yeah. Huge denominations. Mm. <laughs> it's crazy. But until the church does, that's what he's telling you. Until we, until we, re he's not coming back until he comes back for a church that has made itself ready. Who has operated in the ascension gifts, the gifts that he sent back because of his ascension. And we've settled, we've dumbed it all down to some work to do. Praise the Lord. When that happens, it'll escalate the approach of the consummation of the ages and accelerate the making ready a people for the Lord. I'm not, I didn't take the time to read all those scriptures, but that's because that's what happens. When this happens, when this comes on us, when we become aware of it, amen, it will escalate the approach of the consummation, or it will speed up his return. Now you think, well, that can't be, because God knows. Not from this perspective, he doesn't. He knows the end from the beginning, right? But he doesn't tell it to us. We have, and here's the beauty of it. He knows the end from the beginning, but he leaves it up to us. So that tells me he knows somebody's going to get this. Somebody, somewhere, somehow, someday is going to get this and start op operating in it. And that's what's going to bring back the return of the Lord. It's the prophesying of the church that brings the church. Now listen, I said all of this is prophecy. Start reading it this way because I'm telling you, God's got a lot to say that we're not hearing. Yeah. We're looking at it. We read it. Oh, that's good for them. What about us? The prophesying of the church that brings the church from a disorganized valley of dry bones. See, he wasn't just talking about Israel when he was talking about Ezekiel's dry bones. He was talking about the body of Christ. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And, and when we come together with growth and maturity, until the church rises as an exceeding great and mighty army of the Lord. Let's just read it. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. And instead of reading it as history, read about it as prophetic future yes. for you and I. Mm -hmm. One reason it's in there about them, it was history for them, but it's prophecy for us. We're not supposed to read this. It's because it's Old Testament. No, we're not supposed to read it and say, oh, wow, that was tough on them. Wasn't, wasn't that something what they had? Wasn't that great? No. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Those three Hebrew children in the fire. Something is going to be people go through some fire. I'm telling you. But you're going to come out without the smell of smoke. You're going to come out unstained by the fire. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and sent me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. Lots of churches, lots of, lots of Christians. Yes. They were everywhere. Everywhere I look, there's, there's Christians, there's churches, but they're dead and dry as bones. That's in the eye of God. That's how he sees it. So he said unto me, Son, can these bones live? And I answered, Lord, you know. And again he said unto me, what? Prophesy. Start saying what I say. Right? Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is prophecy now. You know, don't you let me. Hey, let me tell you what I'm thinking. I'm feeling this. No, I'm going to tell you what the Lord said. This is going to be prophecy, right? Amen. Praise the Lord. I will lay sinews upon you. I will bring up, pot, up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you. And you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. Yes. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking 
And the bones came together. Bone unto bone. Bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them. And the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Woo! Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come upon the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came unto them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. I'm talking about the church of God. Yes. Amen. It will one day be onward Christian soldiers. Praise the Lord. That's just been a cliche over the last several hundred years, but this is a reality. Amen. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. And behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. Remember, he already said when that was done, then this is for the Gentiles. It's for everybody. Amen. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, John. Woo! Woo! Hallelujah. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm feeling that. I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and you shall live and shall place in you in your own land. Then shall you know that the Lord hath spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. It's the principle of God. It's the principle of God and the power of His Word over everything else. The principle is prophetic. Prophecy, that's how he works. That's how this all came. So the principle of God and the power of his word dominates everything else. Yes. We've had all kinds of different ways of approaching this, the word of faith, all these different things. It's just different ways of saying this is how God operates. And I think the danger is sometimes we get into these different movements and we forget that it's just one movement. There aren't 50 million different things God's trying to do. He's just trying to get us to agree with him and say what he says. Prophesy to those bones. Prophesy to that debt. Prophesy to that job. Prophesy to that relationship. Prophesy to whatever it is. Start talking. Start using the power that you've got. The only power you really have is prophetic. It's God's word. Because he'll bring that to pass. You can't make it happen. But his glory will fill the temple and he will do what nobody else can do. Praise the Lord. We were, it's God's method. We were created in his image, in his likeness. Amen. And we can and we have to operate in his principle. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 4. We're wrapping up with this. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 and 30. Ephesians 4, 29 and 30. Now, what does he say? What's corrupt communication? Anything that isn't in agreement with this. So in other words, anything that isn't prophetic is corrupt. It's coming from an intellect. It's coming from somebody's reasoning instead of from the Spirit of God. That's why we've got all the churches and religions and everything else we've got because there's been a heck of a lot more reasoning than there has been prophesied. So let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying. That it may minister grace to the hearers and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed under the day of redemption. How do you grieve the Holy Spirit? By not listening to Him. Right. Have you ever had, tried to have a conversation with somebody and they, don't, they won't listen? They just act like you're not there? Sometimes you have to do that, but not with the Holy Spirit. No corrupt communication. In other words, prophetic words only. That's all I want to hear. I'm not listening to anything except prophetic words. Because they edify. Because they minister grace. Which is the dispensation we happen to be in. Which is what God is all about. Because he chose this dispensation. There is a spirit life in the prophetic word of God. And agreeing with God is the confession of God's word. That is prophecy. We've had it thrown all over the place and seen it operating in all sorts of weird and different ways. But this is what true prophecy is, scripturally speaking. The gatherer of the faithful praising God. 
That's a prophecy. It belongs to us. If we prophesy, the glory of the Lord will fill us with the whole glory. Yes. And only God will minister. There'll be no more so-and-so's ministry of healing or so-and-so's yeah. prophetic ministry. Or that. No. When we get into this the way it's supposed to be, yeah. we'll just be standing there going, wow, wow. unbelievable, yeah. just like he said it. And we'll rise up this great army. You know how the armies of Israel operated? With God's ark out in front. And what did he usually tell him? Go do nothing. Just prophesy. Just shout. Just say what I said. If I said go around the city seven times, go around seven times. If I say shout, shout. If I say don't shout, don't shout. And the glory of God will fill that situation. And you won't have to do anything but stand there in awe. You'll be as awestruck as the people that are affected on the other side. That's his purpose. That's his plan. And I think that's where he's got us. That's why that hunger is in all of us for this. Because he put it in us. It's, in, it's him. It's innate in us to want it, to desire it, for these dry bones to rise up and become this great army. You say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. God bless all of you. Appreciate your patience. Went a little long here this morning, but God bless you. Have a great weekend. Be prophetic. It's who you are. Amen. Covet it. Go in the power of his might. Amen. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.